quick overview. We're doing a quick overview of um, um, the next two days. This is traditionally what we do at the symposium, normally in the mornings, but because we change things up a bit, uh, we decided to do it right now and then do both of the two days. For those of you who would be joining us uh, the next two days, and I'll start with Carlos. So the we have two tracks uh, tomorrow, and track one is an E2 Engineering 2 599 for the people in, who are here in person. For the people in remote, you know, there's a URL, um, a, a Zoom. And if you're looking, if you've got your invite for the, um, if you if you compare the uh, the agenda with the the links that you got, they all, I always make sure there's a link to the actual room number, the physical room number it's in, so you can keep track of where things are. Yeah. So this is an engineering two five ninety nine fifth floor, right next to the elevators. Um, so this is actually a uh, a bird of a feather. I'm sorry, a, a <laughs> buff. <laughs> a buff. Let's just say buff. <laughs> um, that um, is motivated by our recent awards for enabling uh, ecosystems, finding pathways to enable ecosystems for a particular project, which happens to be uh, the flagship um, incubator project from Cross. And we were able to convince the National Science Foundation that that project is sort of at the cusp of, um, you know, where it's mature enough to receive serious support. And if it doesn't, uh, you know, receive that infrastructure of support, it will fail. So there's the, you know, that's exactly the projects that they were looking for. And we brought, you know, sort of this project, gave that project enough escape velocity to be funded by an effort like this. Um, but we're definitely, the project uh, is in this state. It's an open source product, but it doesn't have any of this, right? It doesn't have really good documentation. It doesn't have any governance. It doesn't have a large com uh, developer community. It has no security. Uh, it has a little bit of defect management, a little bit of packaging, but clearly work that is beyond a single graduate student, right? And that's basically the argument here. It's like these projects get to a point where they're so successful that the graduate student finds herself or himself into a situation where they have to choose between research or become a maintainer. And of course, being a PhD student, they're supposed to be a researcher, right? And not a maintainer. So this symposium is, I mean, this session is really about um, getting together uh, people who have ideas about research software engineering. Uh, we invited a whole bunch of people to join this uh, session and to brainstorm um, four workshops that we're going to convene over the next 12 months uh, where we trying to figure out how to get from here to there in a sustainable way you know hire um, staff for a project that might be possible for a very big nih funded project like the genomics institute but it's there are many other projects where the open source software is really valuable but there's not that kind of funding available. So we need to have sort of something more permanent than just this uh, temporary funding. And so there are many ideas and that's what this session is about. So please uh, join us. Yeah, next is Oscar. This is, yeah. Do you wanna go to the slide or the next? Here, here. Wherever you're, yeah, wherever you, wherever you are. are. All right. So I'd like to invite you for a workshop uh, on a specific piece of software and the whole sort of uh, terminology or ecosystem around it. How I'll introduce this is, um, well, you all know fractals, probably. I've been dreaming about fractals for since I remember. And the thing about fractals is that it seems super useful because they're everywhere around us. And that was kind of the motivation to describe them. Um, who doesn't know what fractals are, by the way? Okay, everyone knows fractals. So what always struck me was just how how little tools we have to actually apply fractals in, in science to actually describe or solve real problems, despite their ubiquity and sort of the omnipresence. And so, um, oh, well, uh, there should be something here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
so the motivation for this project was actually to make fractals useful for for scientists and the pilot project that we uh, started this uh, on was a collaboration with astrophysicists at UCSC uh, being all mentioned that and uh, the effort was to actually describe the cosmic web so how do you how do you reconstruct these these interconnected patterns of gas and plasma and dark matter that actually permeate the universe and connect galaxies together and slime will turn out to be a great model organism for that surprisingly or maybe maybe not and so what i'll be talking about tomorrow uh sort of maybe workshop or other tutorial on this project is um you know how you how can you do this in practice how can you develop a data centric tool uh, that's running on your pc that's actually generating fractals that are useful for something switch so um yeah there there should be something here huh? is all is it those two Close okay yeah never mind okay. so uh yeah so i'll be i'll be uh describing a piece of software called polyfy which arose from another software called polyform which uh, I've been developing since 2019 uh, in collaboration with astrophysicists, but also linguists and a bunch of other people. Um, and Polyform was, was uh, successful, but it was limited to C++ and Windows and kind of not, not very uh, usable. So Polyfy is a Python version of that. And I'll be demonstrating this tool tomorrow. Uh, I'll be uh, showing several different use cases in, three, uh, in two and three dimensions basically taking different pieces of data or data sets and demonstrating how to use this software and how the concepts behind it actually uh, apply in these in these practical uh, scenarios. Uh, there will be a bit of theory and some wrap up into the future. Uh, we were looking for collaborators, contributors, interested people, support, whatever. So hope you can make it and uh, if not learn something, at least see some pretty pictures. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. This is what the next thing was. Yes. Sorry. That's your description. Oh. I'm so sorry. I didn't notice that on the no. slide. All right. I'll leave this up for a second so everybody can make it. Okay. Everybody good? Thank you, Oscar. I think you're. That's you. Hi. So, uh, next is a workshop also on track one, again in E2599. Um, it's called closing the gap between compute and storage. And what I mean, what we mean by that is uh, when you have, so there's always been uh, this, this discussion about, you know, bringing compute to the data or bringing the data to compute. And now they're in a new dimension to it because the data has started to be structured, stored in a structured way, in a way that storage system can actually interpret the data in a structured way. So you see more and more of database-like functionality migrating into the storage level. But with that um, ability to actually look at this data in a structured way, and it's not just blobs of binary or some unknown data, you actually also have new opportunities on the caching side. And so, um, so this cache is not just, a, you know, doesn't do a hit just if you have exactly the same amount of the same blob of data, but also if there are ways to structure or to map part of a query onto the cache, right? So there are new ways of caching because of structured data. It's not a new problem, but the cool thing is that there are now recently open source projects and companies um, that really put this in, in the open source space on a new level where you have an unprecedented composability of all kinds of systems and an, a, a rapid adoption of, uh, of common representations of data um, in the form of Apache Arrow and uh, this new effort called Substrate, which is basically a standard way of representing query plans. And so you're starting to see a you know, a, a, a standardization of how all these pieces from the application over the processing layer to down to the storage layer are uh, talk in a standard way. And not only the semantics of these different systems have to agree on, uh, on a common semantic expressed by this uh, project. So we have three talks, one from Aluxio, two from Voltron Data, 
And um, if you want to hear more about this, uh, these opportunities and how university research can engage with what's going on in industry that receives currently a huge amount of investments, come to the session. Um, I'm <laughs> Uh, actually, are you on? Oh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshay Gurk, and tomorrow I'll be moderating the panel on open source hardware. So uh, it's going to be a discussion on different issues in the open source contributions towards hardware field. We are going to have a panel of UC professors from different campuses who themselves are significantly contributing towards the open source hardware. So if you want to talk to them, if you want to discuss all the issues in open source hardware with them, uh, please feel free to be there. Thank you. Also, Jose is here if anybody would like to yes, can just... <laughs> Yeah, the idea of the panel is to Professor Santa Barbara, to Professor Santa Cruz, and pros and cons, and what are the challenges? Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Saki. See you guys tomorrow on that. Next one is. Um, <laughs> very exciting. Um, uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Emily Lovell. I'm one of the OSPO incubator fellows through our OSPO right here at UCSC. Uh, my background is in computing education and in particular broadening um, participation in computing. So uh, today, uh, you know, one thing that came up is that one way to work with students in open source is to teach a course or involve them in an existing open source project or community that's really well established. Um, Tomorrow, I will be hosting and moderating a BOF or Birds of a Feather session on uh, sort of the complement to that, which is involving students in projects that are really new or trying to grow um, into healthy communities. Uh, something that I really want to learn more about myself since I'll be growing a community hopefully the next two years of my postdoc. Um, so we're going to be uh, uh, running it as a Birds of a Feather, so really a lively discussion. But to kick things off, um, I've invited uh, Steve Hess Letterman, who is the project maintainer for Open Energy Dashboard, which is a project that started uh, really from the ground up, but at Beloit College, so in an academic education setting with lots of student uh, involvement to this day. Um, so he's going to share his experience. I think the project is an excellent sort of case study for us to um, learn from and talk about, but I'm also hoping um, that anyone who's interested in this will come and kind of share your questions, frustrations, um, you know, that we can brainstorm ways to really build community around uh, this topic. Oh, this is me. Um, so we also wanted to get a little bit of extra time on the end, or we wanted to make a little extra time on the end of the second day to give uh, people a chance to kind of talk about um, what they we didn't think to talk about. Uh, so we are calling this our unconference, which is like the last really the last hour and a half um, tomorrow at the end of today tomorrow at the end of tomorrow we broke it out into four sessions um, and. If you go to the uh, Google Doc on the share on the agenda, there's a shared doc. If you have ideas about what you want to talk about here, um, this is mainly for those participating live. I haven't set up any Zoom. Uh, these ones, it's more of a live informal thing. Um, it's one of the benefits of coming live to this event. Um, but uh, but uh, if, if if for any reason people want to try and do, uh, have a have a, a partial virtual, just let me know, and we can probably help make arrangements for that as well. Um, but if you go onto, like I said, the link on the um, on the, the agenda and you find where the slots are and you put in a suggestion uh, for what topic you want, and we have four slots. If we get more than four great ideas, I can see where we can find other places in, in, B, in engineering to, to meet, uh, like, you know, on the lanai or outside. So there's, there are some other options if we have some better ideas. So go ahead and, and do that. I'll be checking it again, checking in that list uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, to see if uh, you know who, who you know who what people would pick out, and I'll I'll communicate in in, way, in ways. I'm not exactly sure. Well, mainly on Slack and uh, probably by email to especially for those that are in person to kind of say what 
what topics are, are being uh, dealt with. So. All right. So if you have questions, uh, go ahead and email me about that. Okay. And then we're moving on to day three. And that's all remote. So if everybody knows that they <laughs> don't go anywhere, like stay at your house or stay in your office, mm -hmm. and uh, you should have all gotten links for that if you thought registered. So if you registered, there should be a link for you um, uh, in some email. If you don't know where it is, uh, please give me send me an email. Um, and that will start with, there's Aaron. So my name is Aaron Hunter, and um, my research uh, was initially started off with a generous donation from Cross, uh, who helped me come up with uh, an open hardware and open firmware uh, autonomous vehicle controller. And it's actually contained in this vehicle there on the, on the bottom left that you can see. Um, and since then, um, it's kind of expanded into more of an autonomous sensing and controlling technology forum. And over last summer and this summer as well, I, uh, I had uh, several OSRE students, open source research experience students. And, um, and last year I used this workshop uh, slot as kind of a, to highlight the research that the, the OSRE students had done. And so, I, and continuing that in this year, um, they're not just the students that participated in my project, but we also have um, a related project that was done um, from Colleen Justison's group, which is about how to power uh, sensors in the field using microbes. So this is an extension of her research into autonomous sensing of ground moisture and, and, and how to power sensors that are uh, embedded in the ground. Um, then we have two, uh, the, two of the OSRE students that contributed to the program this uh, summer for me in particular are this uh, sensor here. It's actually a sensor module that, can, that combines uh, uh, basically a ranging sensor known as a LIDAR, as well as a camera. And the combination of those two provide uh, custom object detection of landmarks in an environment uh, using machine learning process. And then the LIDAR itself can be oriented to identify its specific distance and orientation relative to the ground vehicle. And on the upper right is the, um, the landmark that we chose to train for it. So these are actually two separate projects that get combined into this hybrid sensor. And we trained it uh, on basically colored pylons. And the colored pylons will be stand in for basically any landmark that you wanted to identify in the field and navigate by. Well, for us, it was really easy to use these pylons. So the idea is that we can train the sensor to recognize these landmarks. And this is part of the data set that they use to, to train it on. And we'll hear all about how that particular model was developed and then deployed onto this little tiny piece of hardware right there, which is an edge tensor processing unit, which can do machine learning inferencing, uh, even on really resource constrained vehicles. And then finally, um, we're going to show how this uh, Real-time controller is going to be used for a colleague's uh, dissertation on GPS denied navigation uh, in an quadcopter or, or a uh, UAV. And the idea is that you can train something like this object detector to recognize landmarks from aerial imagery and then have the, the vehicle autonomously uh, locate itself in the environment and then navigate by that without the use of any GPS. So. Um, this is Thursday, uh, 9.30 a.m. It's all online. And so I welcome you to join. Thanks. And I want to give a shout out to Aaron. He always gets the most OSRE and GSOC applications. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to go through all of them. He gets like 20 every year. So uh, big shout out to him. And so it'd be great to see that he's highlighting his students work again. Um, this is... Yeah, it's, uh, it's here. Are the Yeah, um, is anybody online? Tom, Todd? I didn't see that. Okay. Um, so I give a quick summary. So this is a new project. Um, uh, I have a, one of those students who, who are already publishing major papers and I see uh, supercomputing uh, and I'm very proud of that. The, the problem is really cool. 
it's basically, let me just take my mask off because he understands me. Um, the problem is really cool. So imagine you are a national lab and you have to get Linux to run on the most exotic machines every four years, right? That's sort of the cycle where you get new supercomputers. And, you know, they get sort of like the latest technology that's not fully proven. It's not really, and, and, and so the industry provides new hardware, but then also, um, it, but also it gets in return a lot of proofing from very gifted people to integrate, do all the integration work to get actually Linux to run uh, on those machines. Now they have a problem lately. Open source stacks have come, become so complex and they have to mix with sometimes open source derived proprietary software. And then it all has to build and link in a namespace that was not designed for, for this kind of complexity. And in fact, the, the linker today that's commonly used in, in, in the compiler tool chain um, is using really organically uh, sort of a lot of heuristics. Um, and it makes it extremely uh, hard to reason over you know, what is actually being linked. And so they found multiple situations in the latest preparation for the next supercomputer where it's literally not possible to build the software. They have to have new, a new tool set. And that kind of started this whole idea of actually revisiting, linking and building and packaging software in a way that turns it actually into a data management problem. That's how I got involved. And it's, uh, and it's actually also a resolution problem. It's a name resolution problem. And you want to do, you want to create a new kind of name resolution of symbols and package names and binary names that um, is much smarter than what the build environment infrastructure today allows. That's what really what the session is about. So if you want to see something that is really a core problem for everyone who has ever been involved in computer science, which is trying to get something to build. So many hours wasted because of some obscure error or some obscure variable not directly set, right? It's the most obscure thing uh, that you can imagine. Uh, and you really want to see how people now think about that and solve that problem to make that much easier, this building process, much more transparent and, and much more intelligent so that actually prototyping doesn't become this horrible exercise of nothing works, right? Uh, anybody who's involved, uh, then, you know, I highly recommend that you come to this session. Um, you will hear from Todd Gamlin, who is the inventor of SPAC, um, and who is uh, leading a huge project at Lawn Livermore called BUILD, um, which not only looks at new ways of linking, but also a new optimization possibilities for linking. And then uh, Farid Zakaria is my student who is also working at Google um, and is very interested in Nix, which is sort of a competing way of, 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 of reproducible packaging. And we have big thoughts. We want to actually make this sort of a, a new uh, way into connecting open source with academia in really interesting new ways uh, because of the reproducibility problems and also the, the classroom problems that software building uh, provides and software packaging uh, is, is influencing. So, and you're the, nope. And I'm the next one too. You're, you're keeping everybody from here. Just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is very fast. This is a session on computational storage. And uh, uh, these are uh, three students, uh, of my group and two students of uh, Peter Alvaro's group. Um, and we're presenting essentially topics on computational storage, uh, ranging from uh, enabling proper scheduling and storage systems, um, which becomes more important as you do more things on the storage system side, uh, to harnessing smart NICs and data management, uh, to embedding data management and storage, to Applying this to the human uh, uh, 
no, sorry, the human cell atlas, right? Eldrin is going to present that uh, to uh, uh, looking at new storage abstractions to do physical data management within the storage layer. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see you then tomorrow morning. For now, uh, we, the sausages, the sausages, all the food should be coming out around 5.15 or so, but all the posters are out. This is the session time we've given for drinking some beer, drinking some wine, and some nibbles. Uh, and then we have a few students who are with their posters and stepping some mentors as well. So feel free to go off around and check the posters, grab your, grab a drink, and uh, the food should come out within the next half an hour or so. All right. And if there's any questions, let me know. Um, uh, I'm just right here, but I won't hold anybody up. And thank you to everybody online. We're ending the uh, we're ending the Zoom call now. So thank you everybody for joining on. Stephanie, can, is it possible to capture the the chat that happened on? Yes. Yeah, come out. I think that.